So now let's talk about the changes in the general body systems during pregnancy. Um, so cardiac wise, obviously output's going to increase because volume increases. Um, remember the volume is going to increase by about 1500 milliliters of fluid, a thousand being um, plasma and 500 being red blood cells. So that's going to cause us an hemodilution. Um, that hemodilution though will prevent moms from throwing a clot. Um, if we had the same concentration, we'd be at very high risk for having a clot every pregnancy. The only bad side effect of the hemodilution is every woman is in a state of physiologic anemia. So you really have to watch her. You have to watch that her hemoglobin does not drip, dip below 10 um, because then that could decrease the amount of oxygen that the baby gets um, from the gap. Um, this is the reason that we put them on prenatal vitamins and we check them frequently for iron deficiency. Um, blood pressure remains pretty much the same. Um, the first trimester it remains the same. The second it decreases a little bit um, because the placenta develops and the progesterone causes a vasodilation and it relaxes the smooth muscle in your arteries and veins and your blood pressure goes down just a tad. But then the volume starts to increase in the third trimester so then it comes back up to about the blood volume is going to continue to go up and up and up in anticipation of delivery. Um, and so then it goes back up to about normal um, in the third trimester. We should never take the blood pressure of a woman lying flat. That is because because the inferior vena cava runs straight up the back of her which returns blood to the right atrium to go to the right ventricle pulmonary artery to the lungs so you guys the return of blood if it if you this big giant gravid uterus is pressing on the inferior vena cava obviously there's going to be less blood return to the right atrium and that can cause us to have major problems so we tell mom don't lie flat on your back and don't take the blood pressure with them flat on the back because it can be false low because we know that the uterus is compressing the inferior vena cava um, respiratory the o2 requirements go up obviously because the baby needs oxygen um, the lungs get compressed because this uterus is growing 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 pressing on the diaphragm pressing on the lungs so Moms breathe about the same. Um, they just can't take deep breaths um, because of that uterus pressing on the diaphragm. Um, renal smooth walls of the ureters dilate because of the progesterone um, and the urine will stagnate and it will reflex. And so this increases the risk for UTIs. A um, lot of risk for UTIs during pregnancy. We have a moist environment um, because you have more um, leucorrhea in the vaginal area so everything is moist. This means that there can be a major conduction of E. coli from the rectum um, to the vaginal area which can then get pushed into the urinary system. So every single time she comes in for a prenatal visit, we check her for asymptomatic bacteria. If we have bacteria, we know that it can ascend from the bladder to the kidneys. Um, the kidneys are the major filter in our body for our blood. And so if we get um, a kidney infection, that is like just a, just a streamline Audubon for sepsis um, because um, we have so much blood volume and the environment is um, such that it would cause us to have a preterm delivery. Um, urinary frequency in the first trimester you have to avoid a lot just because of the change in hormones but late in the pregnancy the baby is so big now not only is it pushing up on your diaphragm it's pressing down on your bladder. We know when we studied our uh, anatomy and physiology that the bladder sits in front then the uterus, then the rectum. So now you got a rectum who has some constipation, can be filling. You've got this gigantic uterus, and now this poor little bladder has no room. So um, we have very little uh, bladder capacity um, at the end of gestation, so they have to avoid quite frequently. Um, we talked about um, musculoskeletal, we talked about relax, and so we don't want people to be doing this. Um, this is very dangerous um, in the short and long run. No heavy lifting. So gastrointestinal wise, I'm going to, oops, I'm sorry about that. Let me go back. Um, you can see here was our little uterus as it grows. It continues to press on our ileum um, and our colon. And you can see here this 
big gigantic uterus is pressing up on her diaphragm. Here, well, let's look down here. We can see it's pressing up on her diaphragm, pressing up on her stomach, causing reflux, pressing down on her bladder. So, um, you know, in combination with the progesterone, the relaxation of that smooth muscle, we get a lot of constipation, nausea, and vomiting. Um, discomforts of pregnancy, we're going to talk about those. Um, and we're going to talk about a little bit later. But psychological responses to pregnancy in the first trimester, moms many times are uncertain, like, oh my goodness, what have I done? Oh, is this the right time? Ambivalence. Um, I didn't think I'd get pregnant that fast. Now I'm kind of scared. And then they see themselves as the primary focus. I'm going to have a baby. Me, me, me. The second trimester, however, starts to show evidence that there's a baby inside. So quickening is fetal movement. So once they start finding, feeling fetal movement, they're like, oh my goodness, I better really start taking good care of this baby because it's separate. It's, it's going to come out and it's going to be another person. So I really need to do the right things for it. Narcissism and introversion wanted to eat. They many times become like this. They want to do everything correctly, which is awesome. Um, the right foods, the right clothes. Um, of course, they lose interest in their job because they're excited about the baby. Okay, let me move my picture over here. Sorry about that. Um, body image can be positive or negative. Um, we don't encourage them to gain a ton of weight. Um, we know that if they are in the normal weight gain range, they have better self-esteem and better body image. I um, mean, changes in sexuality since progesterone and increased blood volume, um, what happens is that vasodilates everything out. So um, the female, female erectile um, organs are very sensitive um, to um, very, to anything and so um, sexuality is usually increased during pregnancy or sexual desire um, but you know sometimes it's not but they're not afraid of getting pregnant and um, it can sometimes be a little boost for everyone third trimester mom feels vulnerable she's like oh no now it's got to come out it's going to come out of my vagina Eek. what's going to happen next and so they get nervous um and so um you know we talk to them about that we send them to childbirth classes so that they can understand the whole process which decreases fear decreased fear will be mean decrease in hormones such as epi norepi and cortisol which can cause increase in lactic acid and increase pain. So it's a big, huge circle there. So we want to decrease the fear as much as possible. The third trimester, they're very dependent. They're dependent on their significant other. They want reassurance. They want to protect their baby. Um, they want to make sure that they have everything in, in place for the delivery. They want to see their baby. And of course, they prepare the nursery. Okay, so... Um, there is some feelings um, with the significant other. And usually, you guys, the significant other um, feels a little bit of ambivalence. Like until there's an actual baby, um, there's a potential baby. Um, and then they may feel left out. So it is kind of sad. Oops, sorry. Um, if sometimes it's kind of sad that they feel left out and um, they will you know, they kind of want to be included too. So sometimes they have this thing called Kuvad, which is the unintentional development of physical symptoms associated with pregnancy. Um, this is where they have cravings, the same as mom does. Um, and so they have an increased appetite, so that can make them gain weight. Well, when they gain weight and they're you know, not doing as much. Sometimes that makes them a little fatigued. And then when they gain weight, sometimes they get a backache. So they have these unintentional pregnancy symptoms, which is fascinating. So we want to see the patient. We want mom, we want moms to um, see the provider. Oopsie, sorry about that. So you guys, sometimes they're um, ambivalent and they want to see their baby. And, um, they feel left out because there's a potential baby. There's not a real baby. So they know you're pregnant, um, but there's not a real baby. They're trying on fatherhood or motherhood. And Kuvad is a definition that comes up in the NCLEX sometimes um, and on HESI. And Kuvad means it's the unintentional development of symptoms associated with pregnancy. Um, 
they can have increased appetite because mom has increased appetite or changes in appetite or cravings. Um, so they have those. Um, sometimes they eat more and gain a little bit of weight. And that weight gain can cause fatigue. Um, anytime you gain weight, you can make it a little sluggish. And then um, when they gain weight in the front here, that pulls on the back and sometimes they get some backache. So assessment of the pregnant, pregnant patient, how often are we going to see her in the clinic or in the doctor's office? Ideally, we want to see her before 10 weeks because we want to discuss teratogen. We want to make sure she's taking folic acids um, and she's taking a prenatal vitamin. Then we want to see her every four weeks until she's 32 weeks, every two weeks from, then we're going to see her at 32 weeks, 34 weeks, and then at 36 weeks, we're going to see her every week until delivery. Um, they have some classes called Centering in Pregnancy, and this is where um, girls do their own kind of physical assessment on each other. They do fundal heights, and they measure the size of the baby and, and things like this. And we know that these can be very positive trends as far as prenatal care. This is what a prenatal care record looks like. Um, it says the visit, how old the gestation is, so anywhere from four weeks all the way up till 42 weeks, how big the uterus is, which means how big the baby is. Um, the presentation of the baby, so is the baby head down or is it breech? Um, what is the fetal heart rate? Is there fetal movement? Are there preterm labor signs, which we don't want? Is their cervix opening at all? And when we don't want that, what their blood pressure is, if they have edema, what their weight gain is, and we check their urine every time, looking for um, some, you know, some specific things. UTI is one of them, but some other things we'll discuss, and then their next appointment. Um, we also discuss their drug allergies because we know they're going to be going in the hospital, and their religious and cultural considerations. Um, we definitely don't want to do anything that is against their religion or their culture, so you need to be well versed in that as well. We want to do an anesthesia consult, um, especially if they're having any problems, um, so that we can know what the um, if they want. Um, well, first of all, every single delivery can turn into an emergency C-section at the hospital. So we need to look at their risks there. But um, if they plan to have an epidural, we need to make sure that they're a candidate for an epidural. So that's important. So um, the term her story is used quite frequently in the literature, meaning her story, like his story is his story. So they use that um, in this body of work. Um, there's many factors which play. We want to make sure she speaks English. If she doesn't speak English, we want to use the language line to whatever she speaks, um, whatever language she speaks. Um, we want to know how she prefers to be addressed. Some people call me Julie. Some people call me Dr. BT. Some people call me Ms. Baker Townsend. I'm fine with any of those, but a lot of people are not fine. So you need to say, how, what would you like for me to call you today? Um, the religious or cultural beliefs or practices, you want to review those so that we can implement those in her plan of care, her diet, use of medications, what medications has she been on, um, use of herbal therapies, and you have to ask these questions straight away because a lot of people use them because they said it on the internet, even though it was not advised. And then what is your, ex um, your expectations of the health care? today. We look for risk factors um, for preterm deliveries and all of these are risk factors. Low income or educational level, poor diet, weight gain less than 100 or greater than 200, ages less than 16 and greater than 35. Um, so the education or income level, we know that we can have some some less the outcomes on the uh, the goals are more because the outcomes can be more poor with this with this group because of understanding of how to take care of themselves poor diet um, they may have a bad hemoglobin and get decreased oxygen to the baby because they're just not eating the correct foods um, weight less than 100 we really worry about estrogen and we worry about weight gain greater than 200 we worry about insulin resistance and gestational diabetes less than 16 we worry about compliance with the um, plan of care that we set out because, you know, if they're going through their, through their maturational phases and so they may not be as compliant as we like. And then over 35, um, we worry about our vascular system. We worry about, you know, chromosomally for the baby. Um, so after 35 is considered advanced maternal age. 
Um, personal factors, smoking, greater than one pack a day. We know we'll have damage to the placenta. If there's damage to the placenta, we'll have a smaller baby. Use of addicting drugs, which can cause damage to the placenta and can cause congenital abnormalities. Use of prescription drugs, um, you know, it's a risk and benefit scenario. So a lot of times with prescriptive drugs, especially antipsychotics, um, it, if it, the risk outweigh the benefits, they may stay on these during pregnancies, even though we may have some undesirable outcomes in the fetus. And then excessive alcohol intake, and we consider that drinking at all because we don't know what is um, acceptable because we can't study it because we know there is fetal alcohol syndrome. Other things that, that they've had in the past which could show its face again today is diabetes mellitus. We know it's going to get worse because of the, hum, uh, of the hormone human, somato, uh, human, human placental lactogen or human chorionic somatomammotropin. We know it makes them more insulin resistant. So if they already have diabetes mellitus, we know it's going to get worse. Cardiac disease, we know will get worse because we're going to get an extra 1,500 of blood volume. And if they have pre-existing cardiac disease, we know that it's going to exacerbate that. Anemia, we know all women get vas um, hemodiluted because of the plasma volume and their anemia will get worse. Hypertension, we know will get worse. All hypertension is is a vasoconstriction of the vasculature and now we know we're going to, to it's already vasoconstricted now we're going to have 1500 fluid volume to that same vasculature so we know the pressures will go up thyroid disorders um, thyroid hormones go up during pregnancy the thyroid gets larger in size by about a third and pumps out more hormones to balance everything. So if you already have a pre-existing thyroid disorder, they're at high risk for it to exacerbate. And then renal disease, of course, we know that um, their, their, their ureters um, are going to dilate. And if they already have some kind of kidney problem, renal disease, we know we're going to be filtrating much more blood and, and volume. And we're gonna have that big uterus pressing and putting pressure on the ureters and not so much the kidneys, but more on the ureters, which can cause some reflex. So if they have any of this, um, these conditions may worsen. So you guys, we're going to um, look for a family history of diabetes, mellitus, cardiac disease, hypertension, and congenital abnormalities because we know that she is at risk for that if she has a family history. Um, psychosocial factors, uh, psychological status, um, you know, she's on some psych meds. We need to do the risk to benefit. Um, sometimes we have them on some meds that can cause some fetal abnormalities, um, which is sad because there's a heavy evaluation on are these meds going to keep her alive. Um, so sometimes the, the, the benefit outweighs the risk of her not being on meds. Educational needs, we're going to see what she knows, what she doesn't know, so we can give her some education. Support systems, we want her to have a family support system. Is, her, is she in a dysfunctional family? What's her family function like? Um, so that we can know that these can be um, major um, problems during pregnancy, especially if there's domestic violence in the house. Economic status, does she have enough money for living situations? Um, is she getting food um, and a place to stay? And of course, stability of the living conditions. Um, so if she's homeless, we're kind of looking to see if we can find a place for her. Um, this is just the... Um, the checkoff um, for the past medical history in the standardized prenatal form. So we're also going to look and look at her obstetric history and see has she had a stillborn in the past. If she has, that's a huge risk factor. Habitual abortion. This would be abortions that occurred over and over and over. Um, this could be from a progesterone defect early in the pregnancy. It does not mean that these are elective abortions. These could just be because she just doesn't have enough progesterone or she could have had elected abortions and they could have been habitual. Caesarean birth, we know that if she's had a caesarean birth, her uterus has, ha, has a scar, which um, decreases the um, how strong the muscle fibers are. So the, that can be a risk. If she has had a cesarean birth in the past, um, we order the operative record to see if it's a vertical incision. If it's a vertical incision, she's not eligible to have a vaginal birth after cesarean. But if it is a horizontal low 
um, cut, we can, she is eligible to have a vaginal birth after a cesarean. Um, has she had RH or ABO sensitization? And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Has she had a big baby in the past? Um, that can be from either maternal overnutrition or it can be from um, glucose, um, can be from diabetes. So we need to look at that. And of course, we want to know, has she had gestational diabetes in the past? And this just is the little portion of the form that says where did they have their baby, how old was the baby, how long was the labor, how big was the baby, was it a male or a female, was it a vaginal or a cesarean, did they have anesthesia, where did they deliver, uh, did they deliver in the car, did they deliver in the hospital, was it a preterm delivery, and were there any complications. And so this is funny because it says just the last six pregnancies. So if you had, if this was Duggar, um, we would just count the last six. We wouldn't go all the way back to the first one. So in her prenatal history, we look for any type of teratogens, viral exposure. All of these are teratogens, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and herpes initial versus chronic. So we hope she has a rubella titer so that she doesn't get rubella during pregnancy. Cytomegalovirus is a virus that you usually get as a kid, causes some flu-like symptoms. But if women acquire this during pregnancy, it can cause congenital abnormalities. And then herpes, initial herpes is the first outbreak um, of genital herpes um, which can be more systemic and so it can create a major problem versus chronic and chronic can be managed. STD exposures, we don't want moms exposed to syphilis. Um, we've had some babies die in Jacksonville because of syphilis exposure. They didn't get prenatal care, moms weren't treated, babies weren't treated and they died very early after birth. Um, gonorrhea and chlamydia, um, we want to see if they had any exposures because the, if they've been exposed in the past, um, they, could have, they could have it and not know it. And if they deliver um, and they, they're not treated, um, then gonorrhea can cause blindness in a baby. And then, of course, HIV. So we look for cats in the home. We look for cats in the home. And so, um, you know, toxoplasmosis is a bacteria that lives in cat litter and cat feces. Um, and so we don't want them exposed to any toxoplasmosis. So we ask about cats. Um, it can cause neurologic damage. Um, so we tell moms not to change the kitty litter. Sorry myself a little bit. And then in processing plants, um, we know that E. coli um, from the rectum of cows um, is prevalent. So we tell people if they're going to eat a hamburger or a piece of steak, well, let's say it's a piece of steak first. Um, a piece of steak is one solid piece of meat. So as long as you cook the outside of the meat, um, I think it's to 375 degrees, it will kill the toxoplasmosis. Inside can be a little more rare, but it's not exposed to the toxoplasmosis. It's only on the outside. But if you take all that meat and you grind it up, like a hamburger is all meat that's on the outside. So you really have to cook that whole thing to 375. It really needs to be cooked well done all the way through, um, kind of like a hockey puck. So we tell them not to eat undercooked meat. We look in the prior, uh, ask if they have any of these problems prior. Placental problems, um, did the placenta come off the wall of the uterus, which is a major emergency, or was the placenta implanted low, not in the fundus up high, but low on top of the cervix? And did they have preeclampsia? Um, I'm sorry, multiple gestations, um, they, we see if they have that. And then preeclampsia, which is high blood pressure during, during pregnancy. I made myself back in my hand. Um, so we ask about her symptoms, and these most of these symptoms are normal. Nausea and vomiting in the first trimester is very normal, but they should be gaining weight. If they're not gaining weight, it's, it's not great. Breast tenderness is normal under the change in the hormones. Fatigue and lethargy is normal. Fetal movement is going to happen somewhere between 15 and 20 weeks. Abdominal cramping, that's really the round ligament usually stretching out. It should not be severe. Um, if they have vaginal discharge, that's okay, a white vaginal discharge, but bleeding is always something that is concerning that we need to look at and see what's going on. And then urinary frequency can be normal, but your dysuria, meaning burning urgency or frequency on urination, can tell us, hey, we probably, we might have a UTI and we need to get that treated because we do not want that bacteria to ascend to her uterus, ureters and then to her kidneys, which can cause her to get septic very quickly. 
Um, this is just a genetic screening. And you guys, uh, the American College of Gynecology says every woman should have a genetic screening um, because they need to know their risk. Um, so very important for women to be um, screened before pregnancy um, with their partner so that you can look at genetic risk. Um, and then, um, of course, after pregnancy, if there's some risks that stand out to us, I mean, we were already pregnant, but they need to be able to anticipate what may happen, what their chances are, or having an offspring that has a gen uh, genetic abnormality. So on the physical exam, um, we're just going to um, look at their blood pressure. The pulse should be the same, 60 to 100, may go up to 110. Respirations um, may increase just a little bit, up to 22 to 24, but they remain pretty stable, and the temperature should be about normal. So you guys, estrogen causes some crazy things um, to happen, and the first thing is um, it can cause hyperpigmentation. I'm going to show you some pictures here. It can cause spider nevi or little tiny spider veins. Um, because they the vessels dilate, it can cause chalasma or mask in pregnancy, and it can cause a line um, from your um, belly button down to your pubis. Um, other things that are normal with the skin is stria gravidarum, which is stretch marks, and then edema. Dependent edema is normal, uh, edema in your feet, but never is it normal to have facial swelling or hand swelling. Very abnormal and can be a sign to us that mom has got really high blood pressure. So here's the spider nevi. Here's how the face darkens. Um, and you can sometimes see this with high dose birth control pills too because the estrogen levels are high. Linnea nigra is this little line. And um, these hormones cross the placenta. So sometimes you'll see little baby girls and boys come out with this line. And this is stria gravidarum. And you guys, this is somebody who gained a ton of weight rapidly. This person gained 20 pounds the first trimester. I'm saying in theory. So it caused just a lot of stretching and pulling too rapidly on this connective tissue tissue and now sh this is what she's left with so um sadly coconut butter is not going to fix any of this it's not going to prevent any of this the thing that prevents this is good genes um, mom doesn't have a lot of stretch marks and slow weight gain and limited weight gain um, also things that estrogen can cause are um, nasal stuffiness and up taxes because everything in your head swells with estrogen. So um, nasal stuffiness is common. Nosebleeds are common. Um, your nasal vessels are so superficial and when they blow out and dilate, if it gets dry at all, it will cause them to rupture and you can have a nosebleed. Gingival, gingival hypertrophy, so swollen gums because of estrogen, um, but that does not mean you are not supposed to brush your teeth. You still brush your teeth even if your gums bleed during pregnancy. Tylism, tile glands or saliva glands, and sometimes people produce extra, these, this, this um, extra saliva, and the saliva can be so thick that they can't swallow it. It makes them nauseous, so they have to spit it out. So sometimes women will carry around a little towel or a spittoon, and they're constantly spitting out this thick saliva. Sadly, that can, call, that can lead to dehydration. So we really worry about them, and we look at, um, we do a, a urine, and um, we look at the specific gravity and we don't want them to be concentrated um, because we, you know, they're just getting rid of so much fluid. The thyroid increases in size by about a third. So the thyroid should grow a little bit during pregnancy to even out with all the others, but it shouldn't get larger than that and you should not see a quarter. Um, heart, regular rate and rhythm, um, palpitations may occur because of the extra fluid volume and you may have a short systolic murmur. So remember, systole is when the blood um, is being pushed out. So it may be a little turbulent because of extra fluid volume. So you may have a short systolic murmur during pregnancy, which is normal due to the blood volume. And then you may have an S3, um, which is uh, the mnemonic for that is sloshing in just because there's a lot of blood volume. So lub dub sh, lub dub sh, lub dub sh. And that can be normal. It should resolve after pregnancy. However, lungs should be clear. 
And then breasts, they'll increase in size. They're going to increase in nodularity. The estrogen is going to cause the areola or the areola to darken. Montgomery glands, these little oil-producing glands, are going to become more prominent um, in anticipation of breastfeeding. And these will allow the nipples to be lubricated and prevent them from drying out during breastfeeding. Colostrum, which is the first milk, um, it's very thick and heavy um, in glucose and protein. It may appear after the 12th week, so sometimes it comes early. And then if the breasts grow very quickly, you may see some striae. Diastasis recti, so you have this big gigantic uterus pressing behind your eight pack. So if your muscles are weak, um, it may cause diastasis recti, which is causes a separation of the actual muscles. Um, so, um, you know, this is something that after pregnancy we tell people to work on their APAC, but sometimes has to be surgically repaired. Um, lordosis of pregnancy when mom, um, when, let me move this, oh, I can't move it over. Oops, let me go back. Um, when the baby is in the uterus, the uterus falls forward because it can't fall backward because the vertebrae are there. That pulls and stretches on the lower portion of the back, which causes lordosis of pregnancy. We tell her to pull her head up, and that will take some pressure off of her low back. We don't want her to wear high heels either, as that puts more forward pressure. The uterus grows every week, and that's because the baby is growing. Obviously, the fundus at 20 weeks is at the umbilicus, and then at 20 weeks, it continues to grow. Um, you can see at 40 weeks, it's way up here almost to the xiphoid process. Then there's a big... Let me move this over. Then there's a big um, bolus of relaxin that allows this pelvis, the ligaments to loosen, the pelvis to separate. The baby then comes down and his head is then engaged and well in the true pelvis. And so she has this part after 40 weeks, she'll say, wow, I feel light like I can breathe and eat because the baby's now settled down on her pelvis. She should feel more pelvic pressure, but less pressure on her diaphragm and on her stomach. So we look for progressive um, suprapubic enlargement. McDonald's rule says that they, he had a farm. No, I'm just joking. So McDonald's rule says that during pregnancy, at 20 weeks pregnancy, the uterus should be at the umbilicus. So there are very tall people and there are very small people that are both normal people. So we have to take into account tall people and short people, and we have to have a standard deviation for this rule. So the rule says that after 20 weeks, the uterus should be proportional to the gestational age with a, uh, with plus or minus two centimeters in growth. So you could have someone who was very tall at 24 weeks. We expect the uterus to be at 24, but it's at 26. We're okay with that because we know there's a really tall person in there. Um, conversely, we could do the same thing at 24 weeks. If it's a really small person and it measures 22, we could say they're on track. This just might be a smaller size baby. Now, after it goes plus or minus two centimeters of growth variant, um, then we start to worry. We might have a small baby or a large baby. So say, for instance, we have a baby that's 36 weeks gestational age, and the, the uterus is measuring from the pubic bone down here to the top of the uterus. It measures 44. Well, that's well past the, the two centimeter variant. So we start to worry about this baby is going to be really big. Or let's say we have a 26 week baby right here, 26 week gestation baby that's measuring 20. Well, we might, we know that there could be some placental problems. Um, that's preventing baby from getting um, food and oxygen. So we could have some some brain, some CNS problems too. So we start to worry. So every week that they come in, um, we do a fundal height. We measure from the pubic symphysis to the top of the uterus. And we expect it to be the gestational age, but then we have a small variant with plus or minus two centimeters. And this is measuring. See that? And here it is again. So the fetal heartbeat can be heard between 10 and 12 weeks. It should be a regular rate rhythm, somewhere between 110 to 120 to 160. Um, film movement can be felt by the moms as early as 15 weeks, some, um, some sources say, and up to 20, um, and they call that quickening. 
Um, it can also be palpated by the provider. And then you may have start to have some contractions. So contractions are called Braxton Hicks contractions. They're not regular contractions. They're sporadic. And it's the uterus is a muscle. So the uterus is going to contract and try to gain more muscular strength during the pregnancy. So Braxton Hicks contractions are very normal. We just don't want them to become in a regular pattern because we know then that they're not Braxton Hicks, that those could be contractions that could signal preterm delivery. Um, we're also going to look to a vaginal exam, look for a Chadwick sign, blue, bluish cervix, Hagar softening and Goodell softening of the uterus. Um, we'll do pelvic measurements. We'll check from the front, from the anterior um, to the sacrum, and we'll make sure there's enough room from front to back so that the baby can get out. But we also know that there's going to be relaxing into play here, so we know that this diameter is going to change a little bit. This is the physical exam. Pelvic measurements, we do those. The provider does those. We do the bimanual exam. I should have taken this one out, but this one just says, Initially, when we do a pelvic exam, we're going to do gonorrhea and chlamydia cultures, a pap smear if needed, um, a urinalysis. And then every time they come in for a visit, we are going to do a urine dip for glucose. Of course, if they have glucose, we worry about maternal overnutrition or gestational diabetes if they're dumping glucose. Proteins. The protein molecule is a huge molecule. If it's pushed over into the urine from the kidney, we know that we could have high pressure on the kidney, so we might have some hypertension. Ketones is muscle wasting, and we know that people who are in periods of starvation um, can have ketones in their urine, so we worry about gestational diabetes. With gestational diabetes, we know we have tons of sugar. It just can't get into the cell. So um, the cells cannot use it for energy, so it uses itself as in a catabolic state. So um, we check for ketones. And of course, we check for blood. That could be a sign of a UTI and nitrites. Nitrites are split bacterial products. And so if there is nitrates positive on a UA, we know that that can be indicative of a UTI, which needs to be treated. Um, the group beta strep, which is the normal flora, um, it's a normal flora, and it's present on 40% of all people's skin. It's a fine normal flora, except for during pregnancy. So babies who are exposed to group beta strep, um, when they have no other exposure to any bacteria, can develop anything from a slight fever all the way up to full-blown meningitis, and it can cause them death. So if mom has this normal flora, all we do is kill it. Um, when her water breaks, we tell her to come in. We do an IV. We give her amoxicillin or clindamycin. It wipes out this normal flora, which is not an infection nor an STD. Um, and then we, as long as it's been four hours, then the baby cannot be exposed to this normal flora, and it does not pose a hazard. Here's a good little link if you link if you want to look at that. This is just fetal ultrasound. Pretty interesting. So each visit, when they come in, we're going to check their fundal height and make sure that they're growing. Should be the gestational age, plus or minus two. We're going to do Leopold's Maneuver, and we'll do that in one of our simulation labs. And Leopold's Maneuver are very interesting. Let me put myself up here, try to make it off the way. Um, then we're just feeling the uterus, and we're trying to fill the position of the baby. So um, we'll do that in um, some lab. We'll listen to the heart tones. The heart rate should be 110 to 160. Ask her if she's had any contracting, any back pain, pressure, anything that could trigger preterm labor symptoms. We're going to check her blood pressure and make sure that it's not getting too high. Um, we're going to check her for non-dependent edema. This will be facial or hand edema. Um, those are both very uh, ominous, very, very ominous. That tells us that we have high pressure in the upper extremities. Um, weight gain, we want her to be on her weight gain goals, and you're going to learn about that in your weight gain quiz. Um, check her urine again for glucose for diabetes, protein for hypertension, nitrites for UTI, ketones uh, for um, for diabetes or for non-consuming uh, non of food. So if they have a condition called hyperemesis gravidum, throwing up too much, they may have ketones and weight loss. And then we're going to look for RBCs, which are um, indicative of the UTI as well. Ask about fetal movement, see if she has any questions. And of course, we're going to teach her the entire time.
So all three trimesters, we're going to teach her about nutrition and weight gain, fetal growth and development, discomforts of pregnancy, danger signs of pregnancy, sexual activity, and sibling preparation. So exercise, you guys, they can exercise. They just should not get out of breath. If they're out of breath, that means the oxygen going to the gap is decreased. So we don't want that. And we don't want them to get too hot because once they start sweating, that means they're already burning um, amniotic fluid. You're going to burn some amniotic fluid before you actually sweat to cool yourself. So we don't want them to get it, you know, really hot. We don't want them to go in hot tubs because we don't want them to vasodilate out their skin and have all the oxygen in the blood go to their skin and the oxygen not go to their, to the baby. Um, second trimester, we're going to talk to her about body changes, uh, fetal movement, clothing. We don't want her to wear restrictive clothing, care of her skin and breast, and decisions about feeding. This is where we want to go ahead and start talking about breastfeeding because it's so important and it's the perfect formula for her. However, if she chooses not to breastfeed or cannot breastfeed, which is very small population, um, we will talk to her about formula. Third trimester, exercise and rest. We definitely don't want her to go on long car trips. We don't want her to be in a place like a cruise ship to have a baby. So we really don't want her traveling in an air. We don't want her really traveling on a plane, on a boat, things like that. Preparation for birth and then decision making about what they're going to do for contraception after the baby because we don't want her to get pregnant in the first three months, which as soon as you deliver that placenta, and you and your decision comes off at delivery I mean it just ramps up your FSH and it, you can get pregnant um, soon after delivery and we see that with a lot of people who have two babies in a year it's kind of damaging to your joints we don't like that we want you to completely heal this is just a little checklist for that and then we want we want to send patients to um, support groups um, we want to make sure that they are involved in classes so they know what's happening. Now we're just going to talk about the common discomforts really quick. So that gravid uterus is pushing up onto their stomach and then they also have all these hormone disturbances so they can have nausea and vomiting especially the first 12 weeks. So we tell them, you know, drink, you know eat dry crackers. It can, it can dry up uh, the hydrochloric acid. Avoid odors that can make you want to vomit and small frequent dry meals and of course no picante sauce. <laughs> um, urinary frequency, we know that they're going to void frequently, so we tell them to drink less fluid in the evening so you're not up all night. Also, nocturnal diuresis, so as mom is, so the, here's mom's head and here's mom's feet, and so all day she's walking around and so she's getting edema down here. When she goes home and she lays down and she goes into this, now she's no longer, has dependent edema, though now the her feet are the same places her heart. So now she's going to start diuresing all that fluid that she had all day. So at nighttime moms, they have nocturnal diuresis plus they have, if you, they drink a lot in the evening, they're going to have to void all night because they just don't have a lot of bladder space. We want them to take naps and seek assistance. We don't want them to be fatigued. We want her to wear a nice supportive bra. Uh, that's funny. Um, and have her be supported because her breasts will become heavy. Leucorrhea is a white discharge that women have um, when they have elevated estrogen. A lot of people, when they start pills, they have this. But anytime the estrogen elevates, they get this. So we just tell them just keep it dry down there. Don't, no douching ever. Um, it wipes out their good bacteria. Um, and it puts them at risk for yeast infection if it stays moist and damp. So we tell them, you know, no douching, just, you know, change your panty liner if it's moist there um, once or twice a day. Um, for nasal stuffiness, we don't want any vasoconstrictive, so we tell them no afrin, nothing in the nose that's a vasoconstrictive. So for the stuffiness, we just tell them they can use sea, sea spray or just a saline mist. We don't want them to have any decongestants. Tylism, that thick saliva, we tell them, you know, just lubricate it. Drink lots of water um, so that they don't get dehydrated, and they can suck on candy. Um, and that will um, loosen or thin the saliva and then you can use astringent mouthwashes and that's going to thin it as well. Um, for heartburn, we say just small meals, small meals because your, your poor uterus is being pressed up. Um, by the, your uterus is pressing up on your stump, on your diaphragm and on your stomach, so there's no room. 
Um, so that causes a reflux of gastric acid into your stomach. The bigger the meal, the more you eat, the more gastric acid, the more heartburn. So we tell them small frequent meals. Uh, don't avoid overeating. Don't eat a lot of heavy fried fatty foods. And of course, you can take some tums. For if their feet are swelling, they have dependent edema, just have them put their feet up um, during times during the day. Um, varicose veins. A varicose vein is a vein that the valve is broken, so there's pooling of blood in the vein, and it dilates, and it can become very painful. So we tell them to, and we know we're going to have increased blood volume, plus we have progesterone that relaxes the vessels, so it just makes it worse. So um, we tell them to elevate their legs, wear support hose, and don't stand for long periods and avoid crossing their legs. Constipation, lots of fluid, lots of fiber, fresh fruit and vegetables, um, and exercise will help with constipation. Hemorrhoids, this is a bad one. Um, it's All it is is a varicosity um, of the rectum around the anus, and so we just don't want that. And so we tell them don't push, don't get constipated, use ice packs, topical ointments, like, um, oh, it starts with an A. A corticosteroid that we put on it and tux pads. Um, they can use warm soaks or sits baths. Backache. Um, so what we want them to do is strengthen their back. So we have them do pelvic tilts or pelvic rocks. This is just where they push their pelvis up and down. You can do it on all fours as well where you put the pelvis up and down and we want them to wear low comfortable heels. Um, the round ligament pain, we've talked about that, about anatomy and that ligament will stretch, 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 stretch as the uterus grows. So we don't want her to like do side stretches because it's going to stretch that ligament even more. So if she has to stretch for something, we tell her to bend her knee so that decreases the length of the ligament and she can put heat on it. Um, dorsiflex for leg cramps. A lot of women get leg cramps due to decreased magnesium um, from the hemodiluted status of the vasculature. And so we tell them if you get a leg cramp, toes to your nose and stretch out that muscle so it does not make further, further cramping. Um, faintness, we just tell them don't lay down flat on your back. Um, we don't want vena cable compression and don't jump up because there's a lot of blood volume that has to like move around when you're pregnant. And so if you jump up, you can get lightheaded. So we tell them not to do that. Here's vena cable compression and see you guys that can make you have low pressure and decrease oxygen to the baby. So we don't want that. Dyspnea, they may have a little bit of shortness of breath, so evaluate for severity. If somebody ever complains of chest pain or difficulty breathing, they need to go to the hospital for an evaluation because of the cardiac potential there. Um, posture, we want to make sure they're using good posture. And then they might need pillows for sleeping just to elevate their head a little bit so that their lungs are not below this big gravid uterus. Um, so nutrition, we talked about that. So it's 330 calories. Actually, this is a mis this is a um, error. It's 300 ca 3 330 calories in the second and third trimesters. If it's twins, you're going to need to double that. Um, we want complex carbohydrates, no simple carbohydrates, um, and increased proteins. Um, fat, meat, fat needs are unchanged. We need fats during pregnancy. We need iron and supplements. Folic acid is super important. Um, fetal kick count. So if the baby's getting oxygen through the placenta, the baby's going to move. And the fetal movement is called fetal kick count. So we want it to remain the same every day. If there is a dramatic decrease in fetal movement, we know that there's a problem with the placenta. We know there can be problems with oxygen. And so we get her to the hospital. Clothing, we don't want restrictive clothing um, because it can put pressure on the amnion and chorion, and we don't want that. Um, this is a pregnancy girdle, and I've never actually seen one of these in person, um, but hey, different strokes for different folks, and it can lift up the uterus a little bit if it's a lot of pressure and low heel shoes. Um, breast care, um, so we don't, you really don't need to do anything to prepare your breast for breastfeeding. Um, we just tell them to keep clean. If they have inverted nipples, that means, so here's a nipple like this, and if it's inverted and the nipple is like this, that means there's a little piece of scar tissue behind the nipple that's pulling it inward. So um, what women can do to try to break this little adhesion or this little scar tissue is to Hoffman exercises where you pull your nipples out and then you let them go back.
and my poor nipples out. <laughs> Maybe a little bit back. And so that, sometimes that little scar tissue will break behind there. Um, oh, that was funny. Okay, and then a nipple shell, you can put this nipple shell on and see how it provides counter pressure all around the nipple right here on the shell. And sometimes that will break the adhesion. Avoid hot showering in tub baths because we know it vasodilates the skin. The oxygenated blood goes to the skin and can decrease oxygen to the baby. And that's a fetotoxic environment. And avoid prolonged and uninterrupted standing or sitting. Travel. We don't want you. We listen. We don't want you to travel in the last trimester because you could have this baby. But we also don't want you to sit in a fixed position for a long road trip without getting out and moving the blood in your legs. We don't want a DVT. So we say if you're traveling on a road trip, you need to get out and walk at least every hour. Activity and rest. You can do what you were doing before. We encourage exercise. Um, you know, if you're at very physically active, great. Just don't lift over 20 pounds. Try not to ever get out of breath. So you might have to curtail it just a little bit. Um, and don't get too hot. Uh, we don't want you skateboarding. Anything that requires balance and coordination. If you fell, um, then you could potentially fall on the uterus and that could cause the placenta to tear off the wall of the uterus, causing an emergency condition for you and the baby. You could both hemorrhage to death and die. So we do not want moms to do anything that requires balance and coordination. Childbirth classes, abdominal tightening, this is great. This helps with delivery and pushing. Partial sit-ups helps with your um, diastasis. Kegel exercises is wonderful. You're weight lifting the whole um, weight of that baby the entire pregnancy. And then Taylor sitting kind of stretches. This is Taylor sitting. You're stretching out your ligaments a little bit. Um, sexual activity is fine as long as your water's not broken. You don't want you to have sex if your water's broken. Um, as long as there's a placenta that is not low sitting near the cervix. Um, so other than those kind of conditions, we're good. Or if you had preterm labor. Bleeding, of course, we would not want you to have sex either. But, um, you know, communication is key, you know do what you need to do, but you definitely need alternate positioning. I'm not going to go over that. You can look it up in your book, but it is not standard missionary because we do not want pressure on the gravid, gravid uterus. Dental care, you need to continue to your dental care. We just do not want you to have radiation during pregnancy because we know radiation can be can cause congenital abnormalities. Um, so we tell you to go to the dentist. If you need an extraction, it can be done under local anesthesia. Um, we want you to have your your, vir your flu vaccine. Actually, pregnant women should be the first people in line um, because pregnant. if you get the flu when you're pregnant, it really increases your risk of a preterm delivery. Um, we know that in 2009, we had a really bad flu that year, and we know that, that we had some very poor documented evidence-based outcomes um, of these of these fetuses due to the, to the flu and moms having... Um, um, the flu. So I will send you, I will show you that link and um, you can look at that for yourself. But the flu shot, you definitely do not want to get the flu during pregnancy. It's completely safe for moms and babies. So we encourage you to get it. Teratogen chart. Um, teratogen, teratogenic substances. And this just kind of talks about the teratogens that drugs, alcohol, hormones, cigarettes, whereas cigarettes don't necessarily, is not really considered teratogen, although it does damage your placenta. German measles are a teratogen and lead and mercury are both teratogens. But um, when a baby is born that's been exposed to teratogens, it may be obvious at delivery. You may see some congenital abnormality, abnormalities such as a small head or low set ears or some something of that nature. It may not be, um, it, you may see nothing and you may see a, um, a a failure to thrive, a failure to, um, th to meet the developmental milestones. And so we know that it could be a CNS problem um, because the teratogen altered the CNAS and the baby is not meeting the milestones. Um, they're gestational age dependent. So of course, the later they're exposed, the less of a factor it is. The earlier they're exposed in the first trimester, the worse. And then of course, dose related, if they get a little bit versus get a lot. Um, environmental toxins, pesticides, this is one of the worst, radiation, medications. Um, 
and then it says that tobaccos tobacco we're talking about teratogenic substances tobacco is not really a, a teratogen it they have lower birth weight and they have intrauterine growth restriction because of the placental damage um, but they usually don't have congenital abnormalities that last a lifetime um, fetal alcohol syndrome um, is really sad they have a small head microcephaly a thin upper lip lip indistinct filtrum they all look very similar and they all have cognitive um, abnormalities abnormalities and you can see this is uh, fetal alcohol syndrome sadly um, the opioid epidemic when we started cracking down on that moms then switched off of um, opioids onto alcohol and we saw a spike in fetal alcohol syndrome so the opioid crisis has been terrible for the whole medical community um, caffeine there's no evidence that's a teratogen although we do know that it decreases maternal iron absorption and it also can cause a higher risk for for first term um, miscarriage or abortion cocaine can cause congenital abnormalities because of the vascular changes including genital genitourinary cardiac and cns changes um, cocaine is terrible higher incidence of abruption because of the vasoconstriction dilation constriction dilation and the placenta just gets so darn damaged that it just tears off the wall of the uterus preterm birth fetal distress and low birth weight because of all the placenta damage and then neonatal withdrawal which is called nas neonatal abstinence syndrome when they're coming off um they'll have they'll be jittery poor feeding seizures just like any person any adult would that was coming off of cocaine so the medications you kind of just need to know the categories a and b are, are pretty are fine for them to have during pregnancy um, C is um, is a balance. I should have it in here, but C is um, there. There can be some risk. A D is what you don't want. Evidence of human risk does exist, but benefits outweigh the risk. And then X, there is nothing redeeming about this drug. It can only hurt the baby. And that would be like a retinoid, like um, Accutane, um, something that the mom was taking that had no benefit um, to her that can only just harm the baby we already talked about this with my iron supplements and um, folic acid if they're really super um, constipated stool softeners so colase and then pericolase is a stool softener with a um, <laughs> not diarrheal uh, with a, a stool softener with a stimulant so that she can use the restroom um, I will put a list of meds up. The NCLEX now is testing you on the generic name of the med. It's not even giving you generic and trade. It's just generic names. So that's what we're going to do from this point on in this class. Um, you have to know the indication for the drug, the contraindication, the generic name, administration information, and the route. Um, we definitely are going to have prenatal vitamins, iron supplement, and um, drugs that show harm and no benefit would be a category X. We'll also have another, a few more medications um, on your chest, um, but we'll, we'll put it on the discussion board and go from there. So thank you for listening to Antipartum. I will open a Antipartum discussion and if you have any questions.